Hey, good morning, North Lake family. Welcome to worship. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for worship today. Um, go ahead and say hey to everyone down in the comments so we know you're here online with us. And go ahead and let us know if there's anything you'd like us to be praying about as well on your behalf, either in the chat below or by texting, emailing, or simply calling up one of our ministers or elders. Um, I also want to take a moment to congratulate Lauren and John Paul Cook on the birth of their son, John Paul Cook Jr., born yesterday, January 9th at 2.27 a.m. at Emory University Hospital Midtown, coming in at 6 pounds and 7 ounces and measuring 19 inches long. And after 29 hours of labor, I'm told. <laughs> Whoo, mercy Lord. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, both mother and baby are doing well. And uh, so, yes, you guessed it. That officially makes my wife, Charity, and I an aunt and uncle now. So if all continues to go well, mom and baby will be discharged tomorrow. And this new uncle and aunt will get to pay our new nephew a visit for the first time. So, hey, little nephew, welcome to the family. And uh, to Lauren and John Paul, congratulations again on giving birth to one of the first North Lake babies of 2021. <laughs> this morning, we'll kick things off with a prayer led by one of our elders, John Kleinbell. Then we'll sing some songs together. Then Ike Reeser, our preaching minister, will share some teaching he's prepared. And following that, Loria Donahoe will lead our communion time together. Last but not least, I want to remind you that we will have an outdoor worship time this afternoon at 3 p.m. on the North Lake campus. And um, it's at times like this that we need our church family more than ever. So I hope you'll join us for this special time of prayer and worship on the back lawn. Um, Bring a long chair if you'd like, and of course, uh, don't forget to bring your mask. You'll want to keep that on for the duration of our time together this afternoon. So uh, thank you again so much for joining us for worship. May the peace of Christ be with you today and every day. Good morning, North Lake family. I hope this morning finds you healthy, happy, and well in terms of what we've been going through recently. I know we've all had different experiences with the the virus and the break, and I hope yours has been one where you found time to fulfill yourself with different things. This morning I've been asked to say the congregational prayer, so if you'll bow with me now. Lord, I want to first lift up Dan Alston, Rick Caldwell, both of whom are re recovering from COVID. Please continue to remember Finus Heron, who is living out of state with his daughter, is receiving physical therapy. I'm going to lift praises up for Susie McCluggage and her continued healing from knee surgery. We want to continue to remember Tara Blackman, who recently lost her grandmother, Juliet Blake, who lost her mother, and Don, Dan Alston, who also lost his mother, Caroline, back in November. We remember Mike Sullivan, who lost Janet one year ago on January 7th. We celebrate the birth of Lauren and J.P.'s Cook's little boy, J.P. the second. We thank you for the continued healing and health of Edward Page, who just had another scan and was declared clear of any cancer. We also ask praise and prayers for Andrew and Jenny Page as they are expecting their second child in June. We ask that you be with our country as we begin the process of a change of leadership. We ask that President-elect Biden and the rest of the elected officials will serve our country and you in a way that is reflective of the history that our country was founded on. Please help our health care providers as they continue to work on vaccinating all those in our country, as well as, as those already affected with the virus. We ask that you cover and protect our members as we begin to gather back in the building of, to worship and be with our preachers, staff, members, and leaders as we continue to find the best ways to bring our members back together in a safe way. Please be with us in the coming week and continue to keep us safe. We ask all this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you again, and I hope you guys have a great week. Take care.
I usually choose a text from the Bible weeks or months in advance for my sermons. I need all the time I can get to think about what I should say. But there's a subject that's been on my mind since I began preaching, and this seems like the week to talk about it. And that's this. How should we Christians live when we realize we're seriously divided over some important things like politics? Now, don't worry, I'm not going to preach a partisan political sermon. And to the best of my abilities, I've tried not to do that ever. I haven't and I will not in the future endorse candidates or political parties from the pulpit or on Facebook. And that's one reason I don't do Facebook. I don't trust myself. I don't think I need to be a political pundit or editorialist in any way. And I haven't tried to rake one side of anything over the coals in my sermons and ignore my own particular sins. Though some of you may disagree, and I, and I realize I'm just a human being. I'm far from perfect. And that's why I won't use a pulpit to be politically partisan. I don't want anybody blindly putting their faith in me. However, a preacher can't preach like Jesus and stay out of matters that are fundamental to politics. I can't ignore the ethics and values and human qualities I believe God wants us to exhibit. I want us to think deeply about every important principle that goes into all the decisions we make in life. Politics, how human society is constructed and ordered and led, is, is all part of that. So this is bound to be a difficult tension for me and for you. I had somebody tell me recently they'd never heard a preacher say that good Christians can vote for Republicans and good Christians can vote for Democrats. Now, you know, I've tried to say that before and they were probably out of town that week, but I realized I haven't said it enough. And I know this person mostly meant it as a commentary on the general attitude of churches and Christians across this country and by Christians you read on media. So I want to be clear. I know, and if you're a part of the North Lake Church, you should know, that there are devout, caring, thoughtful Christians who vote for Republicans. And there are devout, caring, thoughtful Christians who vote for Democrats. And there are devout, caring, thoughtful Christians who vote for other politicians of other parties as well, or who don't vote at all. I know this. And you should know it too, because they are your brothers and sisters at North Lake. You know them. They're people of the highest moral character who are committed to following Christ, who sincerely and thoughtfully try to live out their faith, but they have different political views than you. Now, they're not outliers, and you're not an outlier. There are a variety of beliefs on these matters in our church. That also doesn't mean that you or I are necessarily correct about our political beliefs. None of us has a reason to be smug. None of us understands fully the way society should be constructed or the laws that should be passed, much less who the perfect human leaders of that society should be. You know, one of the main reasons there are serious differences in what Christians think about political parties and politicians is because none of those parties and none of those politicians completely or even primarily reflect the will of God. None are equivalent to the kingdom of God. None bear the imprimatur straight from God. Why would any Christian claim something for a political party that we've discovered you can't claim for any single branch of the church? Churches are imperfect reflections of God's will. Political parties and politicians are surely imperfect reflections of God's will at their very best. You know, to not acknowledge that is to cut off the conversation that we could be having that would help us all. And I'll say more on that in just a minute. But to cut that off is also to set ourselves up to be judged with a judgment that our own lives can't stand up to. Remember, Jesus said, with the judgment we judge others, we will be judged. 
So, you know, all that to say doesn't mean that there isn't a better or even a best human society and laws out there that we should think about and strive for. And that we, it's not to say that we shouldn't strive for human relationships that reflect God's priorities for us, not at all. But there are no perfect human leaders. There's no perfect human conception of society. And thinking we're gonna find one is foolish. We should never claim that as Christians. We should never claim that for anybody Because there is only one legitimate Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God. And there's no room for anybody else on the throne. One of my favorite Bible stories, too often overlooked, I think, is the story of Joshua right before the Battle of Jericho. Joshua is roaming around somewhere over near Jericho. Don't know if it kind of sounds like he's alone. I imagine... He's out reconnoitering the landscape before the battle. And while he's out there, he runs into this impressive warrior with a drawn sword standing right there in front of him. And Joshua says, whose side are you on? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? And this man says, neither. I'm not on either side. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. What a good thing to be reminded of right before you try to settle in the promised land. When you start to draw up battle lines and now it's us versus them and they are your enemy, well, that is so dangerous. Jesus tells us something very different. He says, treat your enemies like they're your loved ones. Now, just because a politician claims to be a Christian, I think we've, we kind of know that doesn't make them a follower of Christ. I heard a politician say his favorite verse from the Bible was, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, that's in the Bible, so I guess that's fair game. But it's also the only verse from the Bible Jesus specifically said could not characterize his disciples. We must, as the church, as Christians, Be very discerning. Above all, again, we must not identify any political party or politician as being the very expression of God's will and treat those who disagree with us as our enemy or the enemy of God or the enemy of God's people. We don't choose to follow the person who wears the shiniest cross. When a politician says, and they all do it, God bless America, I sometimes wonder about that. Whatever that is, that can't be seen by us as Christians as some kind of declaration of God's approval over what they've just said. It can't be seen as a declaration of America's preeminence and greatness. It must be a humble prayer for mercy or it is just empty language. In these times, I know, our patience and forgiveness have been stretched as never before. And at times, we all need to consider that we may have forgotten before God, before our brothers and sisters in Christ, and before a watching world, that we are sinners too. So how can we do this, we sinners? How can we live this Christian life in the real world when there are real things that affect human lives and we disagree about them? And how can we do that more faithfully? I have two ideas I want to share with you. For one thing, I want to flip the script on you here for a minute. I often hear people say, preachers shouldn't preach about politics. And I agree, there are some boundaries we shouldn't cross for the reasons I've just mentioned. I said, I don't have a Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter or a billboard out on Stone Mountain Freeway because I don't want to be tempted to say anything to a watching world or to brothers and sisters in Christ in other churches or to people out there who don't follow Christ in the electronic ether that I would not say to you, my closest family in the Lord. But I want you to consider, I think we all need 
to think about the flip side of that. Should any of us say something on social media or retweet or mass forward or post on our Facebook page, something to a watching world that we would be ashamed to say in the pulpit of our church to our closest spiritual family, something that we feel could be considered harsh or judgmental or unloving. I think you know the answer to that. Now, I do think there's room for serious presentation and discussion of things that we disagree about on social media. But we need to all think about what we say and say it with care. If I would feel it unloving to say something a certain way to my dearest and closest spiritual family, why would I want to say that that way to people that I'm more remotely connected to? much less to strangers who are looking at people in the family of God and who might think, is that how they talk to each other? Is that the way they look at me? Will they talk to and about me like that? And the second thing, last thing I'll mention right now is related to that. How do we talk about these important things with each other, with the people that we respect and care about the most? I don't have a program outlined on this, but I do think that we need to make more and better opportunities to talk about these things with each other directly. I've heard a few churches have begun uh, midweek groups that share with each other their beliefs and perspectives on politics or culture while emphasizing openness and respect for each other. And yes, that happens spontaneously in many cases in our congregation, but too often I think we've danced around it. And I don't think ultimately that that's healthy. From what we see in, I think, wider Christian circles in our country, that's probably part of why we're at such an impasse. People are constantly talking past each other, or they're not talking to each other at all, at least directly, personally, in an atmosphere of openness and trust, with Christ's love in their hearts and Christ's love characterizing their words. Maybe that's why we as the church in America seem to largely be getting nowhere. It surely reflects poorly on the body of Christ. So we need to make opportunities to really talk face-to-face in love to each other. That's how we'll all grow closer to doing the will of God. It won't be by browbeating other people into it. There's got to be real mercy and a real look within your own heart and life. Again, I want to say, we at North Lake Church have been so blessed to see and experience in our fellowship lived out what many people don't ever get to see in our society, where people from many different walks of life with all these different opinions and beliefs about even some important things worship and work together and love each other. That is surely one thing a church, a congregation of the Lord's people has got to be for, to be a group of people among who we each can honestly acknowledge our human imperfections and at times our willful sin, and to individually and corporately be an example of Christ-like humility and love toward each other and toward all our neighbors. Hopefully, Though we may seem small and insignificant when compared to what we see on TV of a lot of the rest of the world, in living our life together like this, we'll shine like a city on a hill, and others will be drawn to Christ and to Christ's way of life. Jesus said they would know us by our love for each other. And that's where we've got to start to show them that we love them too. That warrior standing between Joshua and his so-called enemies told Joshua the best thing he could do in that moment was fall on his knees and worship God. So may our worship remind us there is no Lord but Christ Jesus. May we all realize we are on level ground before the cross. And may our lives and words be filled with Christ's spirit a spirit known by justice, 
and love and mercy and peace. Amen. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about them. It's not about them. But it's all about him. But it's all about him. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about them. family. Before we share in our time of communion, I had some thoughts I wanted to share with you. In 2015, Chris Tomlin recorded a song called Good, Good Father. I thought a lot about those words over the last few years, and they've become so special to me, and I just wanted to share some of them with you today. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. Because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. 
It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And it also makes me think of a scripture in Matthew where Jesus said, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? <clears throat> and I, I love that passage because... I love to give good things to my children, and yet I am inherently evil, saved by the blood of Jesus. But Father, who is who has no evil in him, how much more does he want to give good things to us? And he gave us the ultimate good thing. He gave us presence with him, relationship with him through the blood of Jesus. And... I just love that that image of Father wanting to give us good things, wanting to fill our lives with good things. And one more thing I wanted to share with you comes from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And it's the story of the lost son. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a just a bit of it. <clears throat> The son takes the money and goes on a long, long journey to a far off country and everything's wonderful and perfect for a while. He can go wherever he wants, do whatever he wants, be whoever he wants. He is the boss and he is free. Sometimes he gets a strange, hungry feeling, a strange, hungry, homesick feeling inside his heart. But then he just eats more or drinks more or buy more clothes or goes to more parties until it goes away. But soon his money runs out and so do his friends. He ends up getting the only job he can find, feeding pigs. One day he is so hungry and so desperate he even tries some piggy food. What am I doing? He says suddenly as if he has woken from a nightmare. He spits it all out of his mouth. My father is rich, and here I am in a pigsty eating piggy food. I'm going home. As he starts for home, though, he begins to worry. Dad won't love me anymore. I've been too bad. He doesn't want me for his son anymore. So he practices his I'm sorry speech. All this time, what he doesn't know is that day after day, his dad has been standing on the porch, straining his eyes, looking into the distance, waiting for his son to come home. He just can't stop loving him. Look at this picture. A father running to us, his lost son. We all know how the story ends. The father throws a great party, brings out a robe, brings out a ring, which were symbols of adoption at the time, to signify, to tell everyone, this is my son. And that is what Father says to us. When we wander miles from home, when we wander just a few blocks from home, he's always there to welcome us back through the blood of Jesus. One more thought from Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give good things to those who ask him? Now, the body of Christ, broken for us so that we can be made whole, and the blood of Christ, shed for us to make us clean.
I hope you have a great week. And remember, you are in Father's hands and covered by the blood of Jesus. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. You know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Yeah.